Okay, well, thank you everybody for joining us earlier this morning and thank you very much, Lauren Arnold, for joining us for a guest lecture. Lauren, mm -hmm. a PhD on cumulative impact assessment in the integration of social economic data. And she's doing that in the Center for Environmental Assessment Research. And so she'll be talking today about social impact assessment, as you can see. Thank you so much, Lauren, and take it away. Great, thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm Lauren Arnold, PhD candidate. Usually I am found in the Center for Environmental Assessment Research, but I actually have not sat foot in my office in several months, so email would be the best place to reach me. I am living the work from home life. Um, so we're going to talk about social impact assessment today briefly, um, but I wanted to start just with a review and, and clarification of some terminology. So this basic term impact assessment, and sometimes people use the words environmental impact assessment and impact assessment interchangeably, um, but impact assessment is also quite a broad term that refers to basically just a process for predicting and managing impacts of an activity. And an environmental impact assessment is one of the many, many processes that could fall under that category. And so when we think of impact assessment at its broadest, most simple level, the goal is really to allow us to think before we do, to make an informed decision about development and to contribute to sustainable management. But one of the big questions then is what is the scope? What impact should we consider? And what this is really about is when we say environment, what do we mean? And when we say sustainability, what do we mean? And so those two questions have kind of led to impact assessment or IA becoming sort of an umbrella term for a family of processes. Um, so I guess the dominant variation would be environmental impact assessment. That's what we often refer to. Um, but early environmental impact assessments were critiqued for focusing really predominantly on the biophysical stuff, the environmental stuff. And people started to think more about this idea of sustainability and expand the definition of what we mean when we say environment. And that's where you get these lovely sort of Venn diagrams I'm sure you've seen before where really sustainability is not just about the environment, it's about also the social environment and the economic environment as well as the biophysical environment. And so all of these different sub-disciplines of impact assessment began to emerge um, to capture, to try to capture these issues. Um, and so social impact assessment is an example of one of those. There's also health impact assessment. Um, Gender-based assessment is relatively new compared to the others I have listed there, um, but it's something that's potentially going to become really important in the Canadian process. It's something that we've worked into federal legislation now. Um, climate change impact assessment is also something that's that's coming up more recently. Cumulative effects assessment I'm going to touch on later. That's where my research sits. And many, many, many more. Um, this dude I have referenced at the bottom there, Van Clay, wrote a paper where he recognized over 100 forms of impact assessment, which is a little bit out of hand, but <laughs> many of these are treated as sort of an add-on to a legislated environmental impact assessment process, and not all of them are intended to stand on their own. And also the boundaries between them are really fuzzy, which is one of my personal frustrations working in this field is every time we think of a new category of impact to consider, we just add a new process. Um, but what I'm really trying to highlight here is that the development of this huge range of different impact assessments just sort of signifies the complexity of thinking about this idea of sustainability and the concept of impact assessment and what we should consider. So I just wanted to mention that background um, just to kind of situate the rest of my talk today. We're going to be talking about social impact assessment, but also just noting that many of these other processes are kind of interrelated and wrapped up in that as well. Um, for instance, health and economic impact assessment are often really closely interrelated with the social impact assessment. So social impact assessment emerged as a formal subdiscipline pretty early on um, in environmental impact assessment history. So back in the 80s, it kind of started to gain a lot of traction in research. And it kind of emerged in response to a weakness 
in environmental impact assessment, which was accounting for impacts to communities and individuals that might result from land use and development activities. So social impact assessment is by no means a new concept. And actually, theoretically, social impacts were part of the National Environmental Policy Act, which I'm sure you've heard of. Um, but they really received limited attention in early processes. And the focus was on environmental impact by a physical change and not as much on how these rippled through human systems. And that became a problem in practice as people began to actually experience the impacts of significant development. Um, one of the ways that social impact assessment has been described is just assessing impacts as if people mattered. So it's focusing on this human component. What do the impacts of development mean, not just for the environment, but for people? Okay, so what are social impacts? So what comes to mind when I say social impacts? And if you are paying attention, not asleep and willing, um, throw some ideas in the chat. If I say social impacts, what kinds of things come pop into your head? Cultural, okay, yep. Cost of living, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Job opportunities is a big one for sure. Yeah, recreation, community dynamics. Well, I'm excited that there's a few people not sleeping. That is awesome. So yeah, you've definitely hit on a few really big ones there. There's really no one accepted definition. Uh, mental health, yeah, absolutely. Um, really important and tough to, tough to include. And we'll, we'll be talking about some of these a little bit later. And, the challenges of taking some of these ideas that you've listed and translating them into things that are actually measurable. And mental health is a good example of that. And also community dynamic is a really good example of that as well. Um, but this, so hopefully you can see this now, what are social impacts? I took this definition from uh, basically international best practices. There's no one accepted definition, but so it's, they're defined quite broadly. Um, so social impacts are changes to one or more of the following. So people's way of life, that's how they live, how they work, how they play, how they recreate and interact with each other on a day-to-day -day basis. Their culture, um, which a couple of you highlighted. So their shared beliefs, customs, values, language as well. Uh, their community. Um, so that can refer to its cohesion. Social cohesion is a term that's often used in social impact assessment, which I think is probably what you meant by community dynamic. Um, so that's sort of the stability, the character of the community, also the services and facilities available to the community. So things like childcare, available housing, that sort of thing. Um, then we have political systems. So the extent to which people are able to participate in decisions that affect their lives. Um, it could also be the level of democracy available, um, depending on where we are, and the resources provided for that purpose. So whether people are actually able to participate in their own governments, their environment as well. So that could be the quality of air and water people use, the availability of, of drinking water, um, availability and quality of food they eat and the level of hazard or risk. So maybe dust, noise, sanitation, their physical safety, health and well-being. Uh, and health is usually defined as a state of physical, mental, and social well-being. So it's not just the absence of disease, um, it's actually their health and their actual well-being. And that, that does obviously include mental health as well. Personal and property rights. Um, and that can be really important where people are economically affected um, or sometimes people's properties and power development. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. And their fears or aspirations, their perceptions about their own safety, their fears about the future of their community and their aspirations for what they want and their for the future of their community. Um, so these things are pretty broad and can be really difficult to translate into something measurable. So social impact assessment is the process of analyzing, monitoring, managing all of these such impacts, both positive and negative. And a really th key thing to keep in mind is most of those impacts and, and social changes I just mentioned 
is those refer to things that might be measurable to some extent, but they're also perceived and experienced by people. So a social impact assessment is about how safe is the development, how beneficial is it, what are the measurable impacts, but it's also inevitably about how safe I think it is. Do people want this in their community? How do they perceive these impacts? And that is part of what makes social impact assessment really, really challenging. So why do a social impact assessment? Why is this important? Obviously, we want to understand what social impacts exist, first of all. There are both expected and unexpected consequences of development and land use. And it's important to understand what those impacts are and the way they are distributed and either to try to mitigate them or to reject projects where significant impacts are not manageable. But the evolution of social impact assessment also aligned with that of social development and responsibility, um, partially in response to political fallout from consequences of poorly planned activities in the past. But it's this idea of if a company wants to go in and put a development, say a mine or something in, they have a corporate responsibility to help manage any negative social consequences that might result from that. And so social impact assessment became a really important process in order for companies to gain a social license to operate. So, and also sometimes to gain the consent and support from the community. Social impact assessment is also important to ensure that communities and people actually benefit from development because there are benefits from development. Um, there are jobs, there's economic growth, there's investment in communities. And part of the reason for doing a social assessment is to ensure that adverse impacts are mitigated, but also to make sure that people benefit from the development and that those benefits are distributed equitably. And finally, social impact assessment can also be an important part of building a positive relationship between industry and community. Um, participa participation, engagement is a fundamental part of impact assessment. Um, and investing in social and community infrastructure is also often an outcome of a social impact assessment or an environmental assessment. So doing this type of assessment, engaging with communities is an important part of building a successful project. At its most basic, the process for social impact assessment kind of mirrors that of an environmental assessment. You start by understanding the issues, figuring out what they are, establishing a baseline, um, then impact pr prediction and evaluation, then mitigation, monitoring fo and follow up. There are considerable complexities with each of these stages. Um, and social impacts do not necessarily settle really easily into the same strategies that we use for the more technical or physical focused part of the environmental assessment. And there are a lot of researchers that are continuing to define new methods, approaches and frameworks for social impact assessment. Um, in this, this morning, I'm going to focus mostly on the first two of these stages in the interest of time, so scoping and impact prediction and evaluation. Scoping, what you include. So when we're thinking about scoping, we're asking what impacts are we looking at? What, are, what do we want to include? What values do we want to include in this assessment? Early methods for social impact assessment were more technically focused and more prescriptive. So a range of checklists was developed essentially a list of here are some social impacts that you should consider, like employment, housing, things like that. But that approach has been critiqued pretty heavily because in reality, social impacts are also context dependent, right? So the social impacts that might result from an action depend on the community that is there, the cultural context, the economic context. So you can use these things as sort of a guide, but you might not be able to just transfer a list of social impacts from one area to the next. And you really need to do proper scoping exercises in order to determine what impacts are important here. What is common in, in research and guidance though is these sort of frameworks to guide how we think about social impacts. So not necessarily giving you a prescriptive list of these are the valued components you need to look at, but a framework for how you might think about how you might start to define those values. And so I've got this picture on the right hand side here. 
Um, this is the social framework for projects um, based on United Nations development criteria. So this is an example of a framework that might be used to start thinking about social impacts. We have people's well-being at the center. People's well-being would be the fundamental goal of sustainability. And then we have land, environment, housing, infrastructure, livelihoods, culture, community, and people, which are these categories where you could start thinking about what values and what indicators to define under those, depending on the context of your development. An ideal social impact assessment would take a really holistic view. Thinking back to that framework on the last slide, people's well-being at the center, that's a pretty holistic view of impacts and issues that are important. Often though, that doesn't happen quite like that in practice. So when we talked about the definition of social impacts, some of those things are hard to measure. And if you look at a social impact assessment that has been carried out as part of an environmental assessment, so if you go into an environmental assessment, you get to the chapter on social impacts, and you take a look at what they've included, often it focuses on a set of impacts that are easily measurable or for which data is available. So population, income, employment. And those things are very important, um, but they might not be the only things that are important. And the other things that are important to people like community cohesion, culture, um, mental health, um, the way that they interact with their natural environment and how they value their natural environment, those things are tough, tougher to measure. Um, and so in guidance materials, this quote is often used like impact assessment should focus on the things that count and not just the things that can be counted. Um, and that's a really key challenge for social impacts is figuring out how to include these less tangible things, impacts and values in a really meaningful way. So another key question for scoping is what time period are we looking at? And this is really important. If we're looking at employment, for instance, there are substantial differences in the impacts and benefits during construction and operation of a project and a pipeline is a really good example of that. So if we're looking at employment, um, job opportunities that are available during construction, those are probably going to be pretty high. There's going to be a number of jobs involved in placing this pipeline. But when we think about the operation stage of the project when the pipeline is operating, there might be a, quite a few less jobs associated with that. <clears throat> and best practices says that social impact should be considered for all stages of the development. So it's construction right through to closure, if that's applicable. Um, but doing that in practice is tricky and does actually, even with something like employment, involves a considerable amount of uncertainty. These are always projected, right? Projected jobs. Um, and there's also indirect jobs and employment that might result as well. And that's incredibly difficult to account for. Um, the spatial extent of social impact assessment is another important decision. And it might be a different spatial extent than what has been defined for biophysical impacts or changes. You might need to look at a number of municipalities, um, smaller rural areas in addition to larger cities. There might be multiple spatial scales that are appropriate for different indicators. And a key note here as well is that an activity might result in significant local social impacts, but regional or national social and economic benefits. And that's something you see all the time in a project is in the national interest because of the economic benefit that it is going to mean for the province or for Canada as a whole, but the actual impacts of that development might be felt more intensely locally. And so that's complicated as well and that you might have multiple spatial scales where different impacts and benefits are important. Who will be affected by these social impacts? Um, the impacts of development don't fall evenly on all members of society, and we can divide people in a number of different ways into different communities. Uh, key consideration in Canada, obviously, is impacts on Indigenous people, um, communities, and Indigenous rights. Uh, occupational groups is also a big one. Um, so think about farmers, for instance. If you're looking at something where maybe there's a water diversion, it might have 
adverse impacts on the livelihoods of people working in the agriculture sector nearby that might not be felt by the same way in the general population. Age and gender is another big one. Um, and we talked a little bit about gender-based assessment, something I've come across in my own research. Um, there's a lot of data to suggest that big work camps, for example, um, can result in increased harassment and violence towards women in a community. Um, so already just thinking about a few of these general scoping questions, what time period are we thinking about? What scale are we looking at? Who, who is going to be affected? Um, these are questions without easy answers. And there's a lot of uncertainty, no matter what you decide to include in the social impact assessment. So then we come to impact prediction and evaluation. The methods applied here are pretty diverse and interdisciplinary. So the trick now is you take the social impacts you've identified as important and you are trying to translate that into something that you can assess. How do we move from identifying a value to defining indicators? Often social impact assessment uses a range of quantitative and qualitative approaches. And there are pros and cons to, to both of those. I'm gonna to touch on a few different examples. Um, but just as an example first, um, I wanted to walk you through an example of how you might move from a social impact or value to some of the indicators and impacts you might be interested in looking at. I know you guys have been talking about Site C a lot in class, um, but for now we're going to think about a mine. So we have a lot of diamond mining in Canada, particularly in Northwest Territories. Um, so if we're doing an assessment for a large scale diamond mine that is in operation in Northern Canada, um, so this is a pretty big project, let's say about a 30 year lifespan. It's being proposed in a fairly remote area with an initially relatively low population density, which is the case for most of these mines. So if we were looking at population change as a key social impact, then we're then thinking about what specific population changes would you be concerned about? What indicators might you include? What time period who would be affected? So now we're applying these scoping questions to this particular change. Typically, I would have you guys discuss this in pairs. But that's not really possible remote on collaborate. So I'll just discuss it on your behalf. If you have other ideas, please throw them in the chat. But so if we're thinking about what specific population changes you might be concerned about, you might be looking at things like in migration and out migration. How many people are going to be moving into these small communities to come work on this project? Who might leave because this project is happening? When does this population change occur? What's the influx of workers during construction? How many people are going to be permanently employed by this mine? What does that mean for the local population and workforce? Also, the type of population change. Are we having an influx of male workers? Are we having an influx of out of province workers? Are these people going to be employed locally? And the key question for population change and the potential growth in population as a result of this mine is, is this change different than regular projected growth? So would this be an influx of people that we wouldn't expect that wouldn't be, would be abnormal for this area? And then also, do we have the facilities and the infrastructure to house those people, to take care of their health, to respond to emergencies? All of these things spill out and kind of relate to population change. So how would we go about measuring these impacts? And as I said, it's a pretty interdisciplinary field. There are a number of quantitative approaches that are really important. Um, drawing on demographic data is almost always part of social impact assessment, looking at trends over time. GIS and spatial analysis is increasingly common. And it can be really useful to allow you to visualize some of this change. I'm going to actually go into quick example of that, which is a spatial analysis method developed by researchers out of California called Cal EnviroScreen. It's a really cool initiative. Um, so they've created indices of environmental effects and indicators. So exposures and environmental effects, and then also socioeconomic factors, and then match them by census tracts and use the combination of both of those indices to come up with a score which is 
basically a representation of the environmental and social vulnerability of an area. So this is what it looks like statewide. Um, so the left side on the top is the pollution burden. So they've taken data like air quality, water quality, landscape disturbance, and the darker colors are where that the blue areas are where that environmental burden is more intense. And then the bottom left side is the socioeconomic indicators. So those are things like low income, health indicators, employment. And again, those, those colored areas, those blue areas are where the indicators are more intense. Social vulnerability is greater. And then the bigger map on the right side is the composite of both of those. So those red and orange areas are areas of the state where we have pretty high level of both social and environmental vulnerabilities. So that's really a really useful tool if you're going to go propose a project in one of those areas that's already pretty environmentally and socially vulnerable. And I'm showing the whole state right now, um, but if you're interested, just Google Cal Enviro screen and you can actually zoom in to a pretty um, high level and look at individual counties and census tracts. So challenges for these quantitative methods, um, big one is data, lack of data. Sometimes we don't even have good demographic data to draw on and establishing a baseline can be super difficult. And that's especially true in some more remote areas and less populated areas. And that also really affects indicator selection, what you actually can measure versus what you would really like to be able to measure. And can you find a proxy for a value that's important? And that's often why social impacts and benefits ends up being a discussion about things like employment because we actually can measure that. Um, and so again, that goes back to what I was saying about the things that can be counted rather than the things that count. Um, I've had, I've been doing some work in Manitoba related to hydro development on the Churchill Nelson River systems. There's a whole bunch of dams. It's a whole network of hydro developments up there. And I've had people talk to me about we feel trapped. People in the local communities feel trapped by all of these different developments on their river systems. They don't feel like they can move around as freely as they would like to as they had in the past. And so something like that, where you see that coming up in environmental assessments again and again, and people are talking about it as a really key social value, that's tough to measure, even though it's something that really counts to people there is that feeling of being trapped. And so how do you take something like that and put it into assessment meaningfully. Qualitative approaches are also a really important part of this and can be super useful to get at that local context that is so important for social impacts and for defining those values that are less tangible or less easily measurable. So interviews, community meetings, surveys, participatory models. A challenge there is time and resources to do things like community engagement. This takes time. This takes real investment in building relationships with the community. And sometimes environmental assessment is not always the best forum for taking that time um, that you need to do that. The other challenge is connecting the data generated to decision making and, and the what's being assessed. Um, so when we're talking about social impacts, we talked about how there's this dimension that might be measurable. There's also this dimension that's perceived and experience, experienced by people. So it's also about whether people think or feel impacts exist, not necessarily that they exist. But when we're doing an EA, we're really trying to tie the assessment to the actions of a particular development. And so sometimes the information you get from these qualitative approaches is not super easy to tie to those development pathways that you're concerned of when you're doing an environmental assessment. So I wanted to just the last little bit of this touch on a few one kind of big complicating factor um, and also I guess tying this now to my own research but one of the fundamental challenges for all impact assessment whether it is an environmental assessment social impact assessment it's the scale of the assessment versus the reality of the impacts. So what I mean by that is our regulatory environmental assessment processes are project based. So we are looking at a specific project on a specific site. The proponent of that project is putting together information about what will happen if we do this here. 
how might we mitigate this? But any impact, whether it be social, economic, environmental, health, it occurs in a much broader context. Sometimes there are a lot of different industries operating in an area. There are natural stressors. There are climate change factors. There are social contexts. There are social vulnerabilities that exist. So one of the challenges for social impact assessment is there might be really significant social issues at play, but they might be tough to tie to any one particular project. So how can you prove that this one project is contributing X amount to a trend that occurs in an area? And I wanted to touch on this sort of complicating factor that is these cumulative impacts. And I'm not sure if you've touched on cumulative effects much in class, but a cumulative impact is basically a change in the environment causing multiple activities across space and time. So it's the idea that the true impact is not just what one project is contributing, but what all projects in an area are contributing, and also how those impacts influence each other and might combine or intensify each other. And cumulative effects assessment is a required part of environment assessment in Canada and in BC. Um, but it's often a really difficult part of the assessment because it requires a lot of data over large spatial scales, also large time scales. So when we're looking at cumulative impacts to the biophysical environment, it's a challenge. And it becomes perhaps even more complicated to try to look at social cumulative impacts. And there are some big and complex questions wrapped up in that. In Canada, a really important thing is Indigenous people and their rights. If we're looking, if we're thinking about development legacy, the accumulation of environmental and social changes, the burden of impacts and development have been placed disproportionately on Indigenous communities due to colonial policies, historically unrestricted development, inequality. And these communities has, have often not also shared in the economic and other benefits of development. And so this collective history of social and cultural change is really important. And it's about how do you understand the contemporary, the present impact of past injustices. This is really complicated and it's becoming increasingly important in environmental assessment to think about these cumulative effects and that whatever you're doing now is also occurring in a historical context. I know in this class you're looking at Site C. Um, this is certainly a challenge in the peace region of BC. Cumulative impacts have been a super contentious issue um, and have been for some time. As you might well be aware, Blueberry River First Nation actually sued the government of BC due to cumulative impacts. The injunction against Site C was also really strongly related to cumulative impacts in that region. There is a whole bunch of industry in the peace region in addition to hydro. <clears throat> and if you're interested, I would encourage you to look at uh, the Blueberry River First Nation has an atlas of cumulative change. There's some really interesting photography there and it kind of gives you a really good sense of how the what the landscape looks like from above and the way that it's fragmented. But these are really complex questions. The cumulative nature of social impacts. In the context of Site C, what should BC Hydro be responsible for when you have all of these other industries interacting in this area? What is the government responsible for? And so I just wanted to highlight that complicated factor um, and relate that to your case study in this class. Finally, just to leave you with this last slide, um, just to touch back kind of to where we began this talk, this idea of integration. So we spent Today, talking a little bit about social impact assessment, um, but that first slide I had, we were also talking about impact assessment in general and all of these different approaches that might fall under that. And often we tend to take a pretty siloed approach um, to impact assessment. And what I mean by that is we have one group of people over here looking at environmental change. We have like a water group, we have a landscape group, we have a social group, and then we try to bring it all together. Um, and so we have all of these processes, all of these different things that might fall under an impact assessment. But that question of how do we integrate those, how do we bring those together effectively is something that we're really trying to strive for now in impact assessment. It's something that's a key part of the federal and the new BC processes. How do we do an integrated assessment? How do we consider all of these things in the way that they relate to each other? And that's a big challenge, but those are really important questions for how effective these processes are.
Okay, so I'm at 840 now, so I better stop talking. Um, and if anybody has any questions, I might have a few minutes to address those. And I think I'm just going to add a little bit to what you were talking about earlier, just to kind of give people sort of more food for thought about the complexity of impact assessment. So Lauren had popped up a picture of Divec, and that's a project that I've been working on for several years as well, although I work exclusively in the environmental side of that, not at all in the social impact side. But I do think about the social impacts of that project quite a bit. And the reason is, is because it has some benefits that extend to us in the Okanagan, and I'll give a few examples of that. So I'm sitting in the in, in the Charles Fipke building. For those of you who don't know, Charles Fipke was one of the discoverers of diamonds in the Northwest Territories, and presumably he got quite rich and donated some money to UBC. As a consequence, we have this nice building where we can do research and um, have offices, etc. And there's also a few other local examples I can name. So up at the Kelowna Nordic Center, where I like to go cross-country skiing, there are a few trails. One's called Diamond Dave, and that's named after a guy named Dave who was able to live in the Okanagan and fly in and fly out of Diavik, and therefore they called him Di Diamond Dave, and he's got a trail named after him at, at the Nordic Center. And there's another one called JDS Energy, which is uh, a consulting company in town who, who does a lot of work up there. And those are just a few examples. I'm sure if you look across the country, there are many, many examples of benefits that are spread around from a project like that. Now, on the flip side, I can almost um, promise you that there would be a number of people who fiercely oppose such a project and would lose sleep knowing that there's a company coming to dig giant pits into the lake that they hold dear. And so the complexity of this is that some panel of people or a minister or somebody's got to actually make that decision about whether the social impacts are on the net side positive or negative, whether this project is in the public interest. And to complicate things further, back in 1988 or 2000 or whenever this project was approved, they probably wouldn't have foreseen that there would also be an Acadie mine a Snap Lake Diamond Mine, a Gocho Quay Diamond Mine, a Kennedy Lake Diamond Mine, and a whole bunch of other cumulative both impacts and benefits for the region. And so there's almost no way they could have predicted that. And so in the earlier lectures, I've talked about how to assess effects and predict effects for like a chemical model where we have strict thresholds. It's very easy. It's pretty straightforward. I mean, there are some complications. But in terms of the comparison between social impacts and environmental impacts, it's, uh, it's a world of, of complexity that um, some poor panel of people are going to have to make sense of this and make a decision at some point. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't actually, that's funny, I just skied the Kelowna Nordic Trails the other day. I didn't realize that those trails were named after people working in diamonds. But that's really interesting. And I think the thresholds question, um, something I didn't talk about as much, but you're absolutely right. Like when you think about some of these environmental effects, like water quality or something, like there is guidelines that we can refer to, right? For what what is an acceptable level of X chemical and X water body. But when you're thinking about some of these social changes, establishing sort of a threshold beyond which this change is too much is incredibly difficult and, and quite honestly impossible for some of these values that we're looking at. Um, so the decision-making component of this is really, really challenging. Um, yeah, so yeah, great point. Um, I'm, I'm going to cite you from something you made, a statement you made a few minutes ago. These are really complex questions, your words, and I, I couldn't agree more. These are fantastically complex questions. So i um, super glad there's people like you and your group working on ways to do this. I'll, I'll also mention um, as a practitioner, I also totally agree with what you said about uh, integrating social impacts and environmental impacts. It is quite a siloed process. It's a challenge. I mean, it's not like practitioners are siloed on purpose, but it, it is definitely something that could be improved because people like to focus on their technical discipline. It's something they know and it's something they can do. And um, for me, if I had to try and think about how all of the chemical impacts would translate all the way down the line to people's thoughts and perceptions and anxieties, I mean, it would probably blow my mind. <laughs>
although it's definitely something as a practitioner I should do more. So appreciate your insight. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a challenge. And I guess um, to this class, and as some of you might end up working in this field, it is super valuable if you can gain some interdisciplinary experience. And the, the people working in this field that have technical expertise, but also have some some awareness some skills in in the social side of this are really really powerful people working in the field so i guess i would encourage you all to to develop your interdisciplinary skills as you're as you're at university and it makes you very marketable when you <laughs> when you're graduated definitely okay last call for questions anybody looks like no so uh thanks again lauren really interesting uh really um complex and thought-provoking Great, thank you. Happy to be here. Good luck on the quiz, everybody.